Hello, AP Calculus AB students. Uh, if you're watching this video, then that probably means you're interested in taking a look at exercise 23 in the Larson's ninth edition. Uh, we like to call this the swimming pool problem. It is one of the more challenging questions that uh, is in the uh, homework assignment. Um, and it really uh, forces students to really investigate the idea of similar triangles. And I think that's the key uh, element that I'm going to try to emphasize here. So if we read it here real quickly, it says a swimming pool is 12 meters long, 6 meters wide, 1 meter deep at the shallow end, 3 meters deep at the deep end. And uh, what I went ahead and uh, did here with the purpose of the video cast is I, I drew a picture here off to the right that illustrates those. Uh, water is being pumped into the pool at a rate of uh, one quarter cubic meters per minute and there is one meter of water at the deep end at the particular moment that we want to find the related rate in part B. So if we start this problem out, part A uh, really has nothing to do with calculus. When it asks what percent of the swimming pool is filled, we're just looking at a, a geometry question with a probability, uh, I'm sorry, a percentage uh, <laughs> application to it. Um, Obviously, in order to figure out the percentage of the pool fill, filled, which I'll denote with this notation, we would have to take a look at a fraction that consists of a numerator representing the amount of water, of course, and a denominator that re represents the total volume of the pool. And that would give us the percentage, uh, once we multiply by 100, of the pool that's filled. Well, I think it's probably going to be easier to take a look at the total volume of the pool. Uh, it's a straightforward geometry question. Uh, as long as we know the formula for the volume of a trapezoidal prism. Now, if that kind of bothers you, just think about it. When you've got the idea of a prism and you're finding a volume, all that's required is to simply find the area, first of all, of the, the face of the prism, which would be this trapezoid that I'm outlining here. And then you just simply multiply it by how deep that trapezoid is. Deep meaning how far it comes toward you. Don't get confused when I say deep as the setting here in the pool, how deep the water is. So if we can find out what the area of this trapezoid is, which is really simple, uh, we can just use the formula of one half times the sum of the bases, which in this case would be our three and one deep end, shallow end, multiply by the height. Now the height here would be this value 12. And the three-dimensional value that makes the figure come out off the page towards you would have a distance of six. All right, I'm going to go ahead and evaluate that denominator. I think we have one-half times four times 12 times six. Um, if you work that out on your calculator, you would have 144. And it's in cubic uh, uh, meters in this case, but I'm not going to worry about the label since they're going to cancel anyway. Okay. Now, for the amount of water, and, and what I'm going to do here, let's, let's go ahead and fill this pool up with some water. It says we're going to have one meter of water at the deep end. So relative to the picture, I think that would look something like this, and we could say all of this is water. Now, I'm not much of an artist, so please bear with me. I, I just don't feel like I should three-dimensionalize that water all the way across the picture because I think I'll just ruin the picture for us. I'd rather just focus on the two-dimensional shape here in the front. So in order to figure out the uh, area of that blue triangle that I just shaded in, we're going to have to understand a couple of things. One, obviously, the base is a height of one, one meter deep. But it's important to realize that the distance across the top of the water here is something that we do not know. And I'm going to call it H to signify height of the triangle. Now, given that information, I think it's pretty clear that we've got a similar triangle relationship here. And if I could, say, in a little lighter color here, um, try to draw in even try to make it straight, this other hidden line 
of our figure, I think we can see the similar triangle relationship, hopefully. Um, basically, what we've got going on is the fact that this angle here is common to both the blue triangle and the larger triangle. And we have angle here and an angle here that are equal because of the two parallel lines cut by a transversal concept. So we do have angle-angle similarity. So what we're going to do now is set up a similar triangle relationship where you can go about this uh, a lot of different ways. Uh, and I'm going to use the space over here to the right to do this. We could say uh, the height of the small triangle, H, is to the base length of the small triangle, 1. So notice how I just stayed with the small triangle. Now I'll jump on over to the big triangle and think, okay, what is the height of the big triangle, which is this entire length across the uh, length of the pool, which would be 12, as to, now careful here, I'm talking about the base length of the triangle, not the trapezoid, but the triangle. And hopefully we can infer that that would be a 2. Now if you have a hard time seeing that, don't forget, you've got a 1 over here on the right side that could carry over here to the left side and make a length of 1, of course, which leaves 2 for the rest of this. So if we take a look at that, okay, yes, that is a proportion that will work for us and help us find the value of h, which of course is 6. Okay, now that being said, we can go ahead and fill in our formula for the volume of this triangular prism, which says take one half times the base one times the height six of the triangle, and then multiply it by, remember the six over here, that's the three-dimensional uh, value. And of course, one half times 36 is 18. And then you could just simply take your calculator and, and divide 18 by 144. It actually um, is a pretty nice fraction. It does reduce to 1 eighth, uh, but we're more interested in converting it to a percentage. 1 eighth is 0.125, so as a percentage we'd have 12.5%. So that takes care of part A with no calculus. Now the nice thing about this problem is that a very key component to answering part B is to use perhaps the most difficult idea that we had to employ in part A. So we'll revisit that in just a moment. So I'm going to switch colors here as we move on to part B. Question is, at what rate is the water level rising? At what rate is the water level rising? And by that, we are kind of focusing in on the uh, side over here on the left. And um, obviously, as water is being pumped into the pool, that water level will just increase and increase and increase. Now, it's, it's very nice, I think, to go ahead and spell out the uh, uh, pieces of information that you're given. And some of that we've already got sort of labeled in the picture, and that, that's fine. But it's this one-fourth cubic meter per minute number that I want to make sure that we identify. Um, it's definitely a value that we're given. Now the problem is we got to figure out what is that? What does that mean symbolically? Well, as we've talked about in class many times, and, uh, it, it, and I hope that teachers pretty much across the country would do the same thing with their students, is really pay attention to this label, cubic meters per minute. There's no question that that implies derivative. I think that word right there gives it away. So it's a d something dt. All right? Now to figure out what is it the derivative of, take a look at the label. Cubic meters. Cubic meters obviously implies a volume measurement. So that's what we've got. It's the derivative of the volume. Now, we also know this value of 1 when there is 1 meter of water at the deep end. Well, we're going to have to come up with a variable name for 1 and it can get a little confusing, especially with the way that I've decided to label this problem. Remember, I've already given the value h here as sort of the horizontal distance of the top of the water, which represents the height of the triangle if you were to set this up and rotate it, say, 180 degrees on its base here. 
So I don't want to use H, even though that seems like that would be a, a good value for height of the water. I want to use something different. Um, and, and to kind of go back to this triangle shape, I have B and H as, as very typical names for the dimensions of a triangle. That's what I'd like to use. I would like to use B for the, the distance from the very corner here of the pool on up. All right, you can use any letter you want. I've seen kids use D for depth. That works fine as well. All right, um, obviously with any related rate question, we're going to have to come up with some sort of a formula. We have to take a derivative of something after all, right? So if you just look at the idea, hey, we've got volume, we've got this geometric shape here. Yeah, let's, let's write a, a formula for the volume of this geometric shape. Now, I'm going to ask a question. I want you to think about this. What is the geometric shape that we're going to find the volume of at this particular time? Would it be a triangular prism or a trapezoidal prism? Now, if you're thinking triangular prism, you are correct. And we're going to be awfully fortunate that that is the case because it is a little bit easier figure to work with. The thing you got to keep in mind here is that the water in this example will just never get to the point where it's so deep that we have now formed a trapezoidal shape. Right? In fact, the water doesn't get any deeper than this particular shape here, right? where our height is, or our base value here is 1. So that's going to keep us in sort of a triangular prism mode throughout the whole question, which is good. Okay, now <laughs> the question is, what is the formula for that? Well, we've got V equal obviously something. Um, we would use 1 half base times height times 6. Now let's think about this. We've got three different dimensions here. I'm going to ask, does the dimension change or stay the same as water is coming into the pool? Let's take a look at this guy, which if you recall, we've elected to call B. And don't get confused by the fact that I've labeled that as 1. It's not always going to be 1. And I think I've answered the question I'm about to ask. Is this a variable? Or is this a constant as water comes into the pool? It is definitely a variable. So I would have a B value here. Okay, let's take a look at this distance here across that I've called H earlier. Is it still going to be a variable? Or maybe will it be this constant 6? Well, as water comes into the pool and the base gets bigger, it should be pretty clear that this H distance is also going to get bigger and bigger. So he is a variable as well. All right, let's talk about the distance across the pool. That would be, say, represented by this measurement here that's being illustrated. Is this value 6, is it a constant, really, throughout the problem, or should we throw in another variable? Well, the fact of the matter is, it's always a constant. Right? Once water is being pumped into this pool, that distance across the pool is always going to be 6. It's never going to get any bigger. The pool's not going to grow. The pool's not going to shrink. So our formula is essentially 3 times base times height. Now, that is a problem. That is a big problem. Because if we try to take this derivative, which is not a big problem, 3BH, okay, we can use the product rule. But understand that that's going to produce a dBdt and a dHdt, and the dBdt um, is something that's going to be a little bit of an issue because that's obviously what we're trying to find, right? At what rate is the water level rising? But the dH dt, the rate at which the horizontal distance across the top of the water is changing, is something that we don't know in this problem, nor do we really care about. So B is really the good variable. H is a bad variable. We would like to get H out of the problem and if at all possible, express it in terms of B. And that's very possible to do if we revisit our idea of similar triangles. Now, if you remember from before, we had this setup, this proportion. And that proportion is still going to serve us well. The only difference now is instead of letting H be paired up with 1, didn't we mention that throughout the rate, the, the situation of water being pumped into the pool, 
this B value is changing. Let's just let it be B. And it's still going to have the same ratio of 12 over 2. Now again, if you're confused by that, why did we use 1 up here in part A, but B in part B? Well, there's a big difference. Part A was not dynamic. Part A, things weren't really changing. Part A was just, hey, ta-da, here's a snapshot of what's going on. The water's a foot deep. What's going on with the percentage? But part B is a calculus question. Part B, things are changing. Things are very dynamic, and thus the need for that other variable. Cross multiply, and you would actually want to solve for H. Uh, be careful here. It would be 6 times B, would it not? So you can simply make the replacement H with 6B. Hopefully you guys can tell the difference between my 6 and my B. That would be 18B squared. All right, now we've got a pretty simple formula for volume, and the, the problem really takes a nice turn now. It becomes a lot simpler to work with. So we're going to do the calculus step. Finally, we get to do some calculus with this problem. dv dt would be 36 b to the first times the derivative of b with respect to time. And if we recall, in this particular problem, we were given some information um, that says that uh, dv dt, if we recall, is equal to one-fourth. And we're given the fact that the b is 1. Right, this is just my little such that symbol here. And this is saying, hey, I'm about to plug in these values in for that particular equation. Now, obviously, what we're trying to find right here, which I'll highlight, the dv dt, it's not by itself, but that's not a big problem. We can easily remedy that by plugging in and transferring. So we would have 1 fourth equaling 36 times 1 times dv dt. Divide both sides by um, 36, and we basically would have our dv dt being Let's see, 36 times 4, double 36, 72, double it again, 1 over 144. Um, I suppose if you were to uh, plug that into a calculator, it gives it a little bit more meaning. Uh, I think you get something like 0 .000, let's say if you round to the nearest hundredth, it's very close to 0 .007, 0 .006944, I believe. Um, but it's also very important that we uh, establish a label with either of these two answers. Uh, let's keep in mind, is this a volume that's changing? Is it an area or is it a linear straight line measurement? Depth of the water, straight line measurement. So we don't want to put a square or a cubic attached to the meters. It's just straight meters as a distance. And then to finish it off, we would just need to give it some kind of a time element. And if you look through the problem, we were talking about minutes. So we've got meters per minute as our label. And this would be your correct answer for part B. But as I've said many, many times to my students, you know, they look at this problem and think, oh, this was challenging, this was really difficult. But if you step back, I really think that it's the similar triangle relationship that uh, becomes the key element here. And if you're working the homework exercises in our text in order, you should realize that you've, you've had a few problems dealing with cones that lead up to problem 23 where you quite often are using a similar triangle relationship. So hopefully this helps out a little bit with problem 23 from Larson.